I was what they considered a golden child, lighter hair, lighter skin, and a lighter spirit. I lived with our mother, and they were exiled from each other and us. Yeah, because they was going to kill each other if you didn't separate them now. And you damn sure not about to tear up my baby girl. Well, hello there, love bugs. Hello there, bellows. If you have not already done so, please remember to like, share to Facebook, subscribe, and visit uptopbeauty.com. Today's looky looky would be our Miss Chi Chi shades and our Michelle Red Lip. I think they are both still on sale. And if you have not already joined our book club, please hit the Patreon link below and or the join button here on the YouTube. And for a small monthly fee of $5, you babies, yes you, can be privy to all the shenanigans before the YouTube gets it, if the YouTube gets it. Now, let's talk about Mariah Carey. The meaning of Mariah Carey. When I was six years old, my mother moved my brother and me into a tiny, nondescript house in Northport, Long Island. It sat sadly atop a stack of long, winding concrete steps. The dull little structure had a few tiny rooms running along either side of a steep, creaky staircase, which led up to even smaller rooms. My mother was often working or out at night, so Morgan was left to babysit me. She left that crazy nigga in charge of you? Is she crazy? For parents to get some kind of mental relief, they take chances like that, okay? It's, it's like they sacrifice for the better good, you know? And sometimes it means the sacrifice of your children for the better good of their mental health. He had no skills to look after a little girl. He would leave me alone and go run wild with his teenage friends. One night, while left alone, I was watching a special on 2020 about children being kidnapped. Totally inappropriate for a six-year-old. And it so happened that at that moment, some kids in the neighborhood decided to throw rocks in my window. Their voices broke through the dark night, chanting, Mariah, we're going to get you. I was so terrified by the news, by the kids, by the night, by the house, by my absolute aloneness. I wanted my brother to love me. I was impressed by his strong energy, but it also scared me. My brother was shattered into pieces, scattered to the wind, and our father's outdated tools of militaristic discipline were inadequate to help him collect himself and prepare him for manhood. The misunderstandings and emotional distance with our father was my brother's perpetual and crushing agony, and it resulted in his absolute rage. For most of my childhood, I was caught between my brother's fury and my mother's sad searching. By the time I was in kindergarten, Catastrophe was already a routine to me. See what I'm talking about with weird kids? We ain't got time for that foolishness you talking about. I don't, I don't give. I don't. She's going to talk about this one event, right, where her mother and her brother had got into an argument. The brother had came to the mother and said, "Mom, give me the keys to your car." What? The keys of my car? He was like, "Yeah, the keys to your car. Give them to me." She said, "No, I'm not giving you the keys to my car." Oh, yes, you are. No, I'm not. All of a sudden, them two are yelling at each other face to face, nose to nose, yelling and screaming at each other. Mariah, young Mariah is right there watching the whole event like, oh my God, this boy is going to kill my man. I was terrified. My whole body stiffened. 
eyes opened wide. I fixed on the space between them and cried out, stop it, stop it, over and over again through my tears. I was hoping maybe my cry could slip into the space and disarm them for a moment. Uh -uh. Suddenly there was a loud, sharp noise, like an actual gunshot. My brother had pushed my mother with such force that her body slammed into the wall, making a loud cracking sound. I saw her frame go rigid. For a moment, she appeared frozen against the wall, pinned up like a painting. Her feet lifted several inches off the ground. Next thing I knew, she was totally limp, as if her bones had melted. Folding onto the floor, it was a split second. It was an eternity. My eyes were still fixed in place. Only now I was looking at my mother collapsed in a crumpled pile on the floor. My brother stomped out and slammed the door, shaking the house one last time and sped off in her car. I stood there for a moment in the eerie silence. I could hear myself breathing, but I couldn't tell if my mother still was. A chilling clarity came to me just as a soft part of my childhood left. Without taking my eyes from my motionless mother, I pulled myself together. I felt it heavy and cold pressed against my small ear. My little fingers pushed down the square buttons in a familiar sequence. It was the number of one of my mother's friends whose house she would sometimes visit to hang out. Since I was only six years old, hers was one of the few numbers I had memorized. If I, if we relied on our memory to call, oh my God, you know, I don't remember no number. If I didn't learn your number before cell phones came into play, then I don't know it by heart. Clearing my voice so I could be heard over the telephone's static hum, choking on tears, I did my best to calmly tell her my brother really hurt my mother and I'm home alone. Please come help. I don't remember what she said. I hung up still feeling focused. My eyes still fixed on my mother's body. I went into a sort of trance. I don't know how I stood there, just that I snapped out of it at the sound of a loud banging on the door. I to open it for my mother's friend and several policemen rushed in. I couldn't understand what anyone was saying, but I watched as they hurried over to where my mother was lying. Next thing I knew, she was moving. The moment I realized she was alive, the spell of shock broke and a gush of fear and panic rushed over me. The dawning realization of what had actually happened what had almost happened and what unknown future was waiting. I could hear the faint sound of my mother's voice as she stirred back to consciousness. Then I heard a crystal clear voice ringing out just above my head. It was a man's voice, a voice that I will never forget. One of the cops looking down at me, but speaking to another cop beside him said, if this kid makes it, it'll be a miracle. And that night I became less of a kid and more of a murderer. My mother added a leaf to her tiny wooden table, making it almost family sized for the day. With a few simple decorations, the table became the festive centerpiece, along with a Charlie Brownish tree of an otherwise makeshift finished living room in the rundown house where the two of us lived. Despite our circumstances, my mother wanted us to have a wonderful life. Mother wasn't much of a cook, but for Christmas dinner, she tried. We both tried. We tried to put all the trauma and drama that infected the rest of our lives on hold and just have a peaceful Christmas meal. Too much to ask. I think not. Why, I, this is where she begins speaking of why her Christmas albums are so important to her. Because when she sings her Christmas music, it's what she dreams of or what she dreamt of as a child. My sister and brother clearly couldn't stand each other, but their deep resentment towards me was a constant, silent menace simmering right below the surface. I was the third and the youngest child and our parents were divorced by the time I was three. I was what they considered a golden child, lighter hair, lighter skin, and a lighter spirit. I lived with our mother and they were exiled from each other and us. 
Yeah, because they was going to kill each other if you didn't separate them ninjas. You had to separate them, and you damn sure not about to tell my baby girl. I'm listen. I am not condoning, you know, parents giving away their children to the system. I'm not condoning that. But I got a little one here and she ain't up yet. They existed okay. in a different kind of pain, absorbing whatever hostility under loved, troubled, mixed kids do in a neighborhood, black or white. I believed they believed I was passing. There I was with my blondish hair, living with our white mother in what they considered a safe white neighborhood. Their resentment towards me was perhaps the one thing they had in common. They seemed bound in that bitterness. I actually understood why they were angry and hateful towards me. But at the time, I couldn't fathom why every year they just had to ruin Christmas. My mother was culturally open when I was young and had a diverse group of friends. I remember I had a friend, let's call her Ashley, whose mother was gay. Ashley had no clue. My mother was very matter of fact about Ashley's mom being gay. And she lives with her partner, no big deal. And it really wasn't. Two of my favorite people were my gunkles, gay uncles. I ain't never heard that word before ever. And my gaunties? Is, is, is me and my wife gaunties? Two of my favorite people were my gunkles, gay uncles, Bert and Myron. They were wonderful, and so was their home. It wasn't a grand spread, but theirs was a charming mid-sized brick house set back on a sweet piece of wood land. While raspberries grew in the backyard and they had a golden Labrador named Sparkle, when they traveled, my mother and I would house sit for them. I reveled in the cleanliness and comfort. Bert was a school teacher and a photographer, and Myron was, as he put it, stay-at-home wife. Myron was a vision. He wore a perfectly coiffed beard and his hair was always blown out in cascading layers, which he would finish off with a shimmering frosting spray. Child, remember that damn spray? Why did we do that to our, why did we do that? Why did we do that? That's up there with awkwardness. Putting that stuff in our hair, we don't know what the hell that was. He was perpetually tanned and sashayed around the house in spectacular, multicolored silk caftans. Bert would bring me out in their yard to take photos of me. I just adored showing off in front of a camera. And he totally encouraged my exaggerated poses. He fully supported and understood my propensity for extraness. I remember being stuck at their house on holiday during an ice storm, which I hoped would never end. Bert and Myron gave me my first taste of what a homey Christmas really felt like. They provided an example of a homey lifestyle in general. My gunkles supported the showgirl in me. Whenever I wanted to put on my own little production, which was frequently, they would pay full attention to me. They never tried to tame my over-the-top imagination. They knew, they saw her. I actually did bang out most of the Christmas songs on a cheap little Casio keyboard, but it's the feeling I wanted the song to capture. There's a sweetness, a clarity, a purity to it. It didn't stem from Christian inspiration, although I certainly sung and written from the soulful and spiritual perspective. Instead, this song came from a childlike space. When I wrote it at 22 years old, I wasn't that far away from being a child. I recorded an entire Christmas album, which was a risk. You just didn't see Christmas videos on MTV back then. In fact, it was almost unheard of for anyone, let alone such a young singer so early in her career to write and record an original Christmas song that was a legit smash hit. My father always reminded me of a sunflower, tall, proud, and stoic, but also bright, strong, handsome, and self possessed. He labored hard to reach up and out of the harsh ground in which he was rooted. He was determined to transcend the limitations faced 
by his parents, their siblings, and their whole generation. He was the only child of his father, Robert, and mother, Addie. He was embarrassed by Addie's third grade education. I've told y'all before that my grandmother only had a second grade education. That's just how it was back then. Uh, you know, if you had younger siblings and you were the oldest, you know, like myself, both my grandmothers or my maternal and paternal grandmother uh, were the oldest and they had to take care of their younger siblings. But you had to drop out and help out. But when I reflect upon my grandmother who only has a second grade education, I don't look at it like, oh, she didn't complete grade school. I look at it like, look at the things that she has accomplished with only a second grade education. I believe that her father is truly beaten down by being a black man, you know? And I think, and I feel like he felt that marrying a white woman would help him to overcome some of his insecurities about being a black man, okay? But it didn't. It only exacerbated the situation. So, you know, we'll read more. Eddie was tough on her son, and so he grew to respect and rely on order and logic. By his own strength, he hauled himself out of the violent, oppressive environment that had driven one of his uncles to kill another. My father craved discipline, culture, and freedom, so he joined the military, a logical choice for a man who'd had no say over the time or skin into which he was born. The military may have taken my father out of the Bronx, but it did not remove him from the perils of being a black man in America. If you have not already done so, please remember to like, share to Facebook, subscribe, and visit uptopbeauty.com. Now remember this, the same people that you meet on the way up will always be the same people that you meet on the way down. My naysayers, my patron loves you babies. Y'all better have a good one. Look, my wife is, uh, oh, you can't even see it. But anyway, my wife is doing our deck. She too cheap. You know, she a Virgo to pay somebody to do it. So she got shit all over the daggone house. And I can't even, you know, take my video in peace because she got shiz all over the house.